all tomorrows, a billion year chronicle of the myriad species and mixed fortunes of man by CM Kosman. Part two of a two part series. The link to part one in the description. Without further ado, let's get into the story. Spacers. It must be remembered that the star people did not succumb entirely to the Q invasions. While their worlds fell away one by one, some star people took refuge in the void of space. One after another, entire communities scrambled into generation ships and had cast themselves off into the darkness, hoping to go unnoticed by the beings that had overrun the galaxy. Desperate times made for desperate measures. As the star men had observed during their initial colonization of the galaxy, life in generation ships inevitably led to mass insanity and anarchy. This time, humanity had to adapt themselves or face extinction. Entire asteroid fields were confiscated and hollowed out to make spaceships of unseen size. These hollow shells cradled bubbles of precious air and water, but no artificial gravity of any kind. It was discovered that a purely ethereal existence would ease the stress of interstellar exile, provided that its inhabitants were adapted for life inside such an environment. Furthermore, people were forced to change themselves. In an atmospherically sealed, gravity-free environment, their bones were left free to grow longer, thinner, spindlier. Their circulatory and digestive systems were pressurized to avoid heart problems and congestion. The latter change had another advantageous side effect. Humans could navigate through the void with jets of air expelled from modified anuses. Such experiments were numerous and usually plagued with failure, yet they did succeed in creating a future, sealed tight in their moon-sized, air-filled, weightless havens. The descendants of the star people managed to evade the scourge of Q. It was an endless diaspora. Even after the Q left, they would find themselves too divergent to have anything to do with their ancestral lifestyles the survivors of the initial hurdle would never set foot on a planet again. Ruin Haunters A particular human species singled out by its lucky access to the heritage of its stellar ancestors would eventually get to play a leading role in the shape of things to come. They had gotten through the Q invasion with relatively little degradation. Yes, they had been reduced to the level of apes, but their recovery had been quick. Apparently, the Q had not worked as hard at suppressing their intelligence, nor had they made a comparable effort to wipe away the material traces of the star men. Even after millions of years, enormous ruins of the global urban spaces littered the continent of their world. Thus did the ruin haunters earn their name. With developed minds and unrestricted access to the wisdom of the ancient cities, the exponential pace of their development was only natural. One by one, they deciphered and built upon the secrets of the bygone star people until they almost equaled their galactic ancestors in wisdom and skill. All this development happened in an unnaturally short period of time, and sometimes the old technologies were not even understood as they were blindly replicated. Needless to say, such a pace of development put premature stress on the social and political structures of the ruin haunters. They barely survived the five consecutive world wars that raked their planet, two of which were thermonuclear exchanges. They made it through. Their baptism by fire had hardened and awakened them. The wars united them politically and pushed their technological capabilities even beyond the level of the star men. Coincidentally, they also developed a dangerous form of autochthonous madness. The ruin haunters had come to believe that they were the sole descendants and the true heirs of the star people, and they were ready and willing to do anything in order to claim their fictitious bygone golden age. Sentience Reborn 
if any sort of periodical arrangement can be brought to the history of mankind, the post Q era of emerging human animals can be likened to a series of millennial dark ages. However, like any dark age situation, these periods of silence had finite lifespans one by one, like stars emerging from the fog. New civilizations were born out of the shattered remnants of mankind. In some cases, the recovery was swift and straightforward. In most other situations, it came only after a lengthy series of adaptive radiations, extinctions, and secondary diversifications. Within these lines of descent, there was as much distance between the initial post-humans and their intelligent descendants as between the first crustacean fuzzballs and homo sapiens. Sooner or later, human intelligence returned to the cosmos. But except for their shared ancestry, these new people had nothing in common with people of today or even each other. Extinction. Not all human animals made it through. In fact, it must be realized that the majority of post-Q humans died out during the eras of transition. Extinction, the utter and absolute death of an entire family, entire community, entire species, was rampant in the galaxy. There was nothing cruel or dramatic in all of this. Extinction was as common and natural as speciation. Sometimes a species failed to adapt to competition or the abrupt change of conditions. In other occasions, their numbers dwindled across imperceptible gulfs of time. This way or the other, human animals faded out. In all this death, however, there was new life. As one species vacated a certain niche, others would soon step in to take its place. Adaptive radiations would follow, filling in the blanks with a myriad of diverse and varied forms. Despite the fallen, the flow of life would proceed, blazing in constant turnover. Snake people, descendants of the worms. The scorching sun eventually cooled down and life flooded back to the surface of her subterranean stronghold. As animals of all kinds exploded into the terrestrial niches that had been left vacant for millennia, so did the descendants of the worms. On the surface, they found new opportunities as entire assemblages of serpentine grazers, swimmers, predators, and people. One form descended from tree-climbing mammalian snakes, re-evolved the human intelligence that had lain dormant for so long. They observed, contemplated, philosophized with novel, spirally coiled brains and handled the world with a singular pelvic hand borne out from the remnants of their ancestors' feet. They looked nothing at all like their distant human ancestors, but their social development followed a similar path. Several agricultural world empires, followed by industrial revolutions, social experiments, world wars, civil wars, globalization. But then again, socio-political parallelism in history did not necessarily imply a similar or even recognizable human world. Modern cities of the global snake world were tangles of pipe-like roads, branching three-dimensional railroads and windowless, hole-like buildings. Through their knotted architecture differed from region to region, these settlements generally looked like kilometer-wide balls of glass, metal, plastic, and cloth, wrapped so tightly that a human of today would find it impossible to move inside them. Plazas and open areas were totally absent as they presented navigational obstacles and areas of insecurity. Their evolutionary background in the trees had made the snake people into borderline agoraphobes. None of these, of course, was unusual to the snakes in any way. Their relatively alien lifestyle was as particular to them as ours is to us. All across their world, the arterial cities throbbed with people, each with their own joys, sorrows, chores, 
living out lives as human as any other intelligent beings. Killer folk, descendants of the human predators. The carnivores also rebounded into civilization. Their journey involved a series of changes during which they lost the adaptations which had allowed them to endure as the top predators of their world. The saber teeth, once used for slashing through sinew and trachea, became fragile and thin, only used as organs of social display. The hook-like thumb claws were also reduced, but not deleted. In their place, the last two digits rotated perpendicularly to become newfangled graspers. All this graciality, however, did not mean weakness. Although they were no longer specialized for hunting, the killer folk could still kill with their bare hands, but only if they really wanted to. What enormous claws and teeth could not do, they could easily achieve with bow, arrow, flintlock repeater, or gas rifle. Their descendants from predators gave the killer folk a unique social profile. Almost all of their religions and rituals allowing for periods of completely natural animalistic hunts and duels. This necessity of venting these atavistic urges also led to the formation of religious hunter nobilities. Privileged warriors who were skilled at the art of hunting, war, and murder. Entire societies were assembled underneath these ruling classes, orderly communities that erupted once every year into an orgy of death, sex, and prayer. For thousands of years, nomadic warriors, together with their vast herds of once human livestock, chased and battled each other across a chessboard of continents. All of this chaos was to be swept away with the advent of modernity. In a development comparable to an industrial revolution, one nation pack of killers devised methods of settled, intensive factory farming, organized state structure, secularism, and technological leapfrogging were quick to follow. Needless to say, such developments polarized the world into bands of progressive developed factory herders and increasingly fanatical hunting states. While one side condemned their old animal ways, the other side embraced them with blind zealotry. This was their crisis of modernity. The balkanization of the progressive and conservative factions on the road to global unity. Fortunately, the killers managed to pull themselves through, even after drifting dangerously close to global conflicts at certain points. Tool breeders, descendants of the swimmers. They used to be simple creatures, descendants of a battered people that had taken to the sea. Their remote sapien ancestors would have given such beings no chance of a sentient comeback for they thought that technological advances were impossible in the fluid medium of the oceans. But the swimmers disproved such predictions by founding one of the most advanced and most outrageously alien cultures of the entire human lineage. Fire, the cornerstone of industrial engineering, was almost impossible to sustain and use underwater. But the breeders simply chose another path when complex tool-making proved impractical. They began to breed their tools and machines for them. It had started long before the species was even intelligent. In the endless variety of life in the seas, the swimmers always adopted and controlled the organisms that were useful in some way. Once domesticated, these creatures were willingly or unintentionally modified through artificial selection and conditioning. The process was slow, but once underway, these effects were formidable. A modern city of the breeders was a sight to behold. Huge heart-like creatures pumped out nutritious fluids to a network of self-repairing living conduits. This was their equivalent of a power grid, and it reached every single one of the breeders' huge exoskeleton dwellings, powering bioluminescent lights, flickering cephalopod skin televisions, 
medicinal sea squirts, and countless other devices that had been bred from living creatures. The advances in biology had risen exponentially until genetic engineering was completely mastered. Modern breeders did not even need to use animals. A simple manipulation of cultured tissues and stem cells could give solutions to any problem at hand. The mastery of genetics had conquered many obstacles. The yawning ocean depths, as well as the planet's few tiny land masses, were now firmly within the breeder's grasp. However, they were not content with mere planetary dreams. New forms and bizarre creatures were still being developed in daring attempts to conquer the one realm that was most hostile to life. Sealed in their living ships, the breeders wished to return to the stars. Sarah Sapiens, livestock of the lizard herders. One of humanity's eventual inheritors was not even human. They came from the reptilian stock that had proliferated during the demise of the lizard herders. Theirs was a true case of a world turned upside down. As the humans degenerated into witless animals, the cold-blooded reptiles prospered in the tropical climate of their planet. Millennia passed, and they begun to produce increasingly smarter forms, one of which distantly resembled featherless versions of the predatory dinosaurs of the past, actually crossed over the threshold of sentience and built up a civilization. These fledgling creatures were quick to understand the true origins of the monstrous ruins littering their planet, ruins that until then had been considered natural aberrations or timeless memorabilia of gods. Now, however, they saw the intermingled ruins of the Q and the star people for what they really were. It was through this understanding that the biologically unrelated Saros took up the cultural identity of humanity. In their archaeological efforts, the Saros began to understand that the animals that they used for food and labor were descended from the founders of their very existence. And somewhere in the stars lurked the forces that malformed them. Forces greater than the star people. Dark forces that might someday return. The human animals served as a reminder, just as Pandaravis had, that if the Soros sapiens wanted to assume their continued existence in the cosmos, they had to be watchful. The pressure of such a reality put their cultures under enormous stress. Some factions turned to made-up religions and remained ignorant under an umbrella of comforting fantasies. Others acknowledged the threat of the galaxy, but reverted to a paranoid rhetoric of conservationism. The galaxy had scared them greatly. Finally, there were those who saw the galactic redoubt and acted to face the odds, however great they might be. Conflicts and even wars were not uncommon between these three factions. In the end, the centuries-long dispute began to resolve in the progressive faction's favor. As they expanded their sphere of knowledge, influence, and activity, the Sarasapiens became as human as any other civilization opening up to the galaxy. Modular people, descendants of the colonials. The blind workings of evolution followed the unlikeliest paths, made use of the most fleeting opportunities. The very existence of the modular people was testimony to this fact. Their ancestors, the colonials, would have been seen as hopeless cripples by almost any observer. They lacked coherent organs, and their existence was limited to carpeting water shores like mats of algae. But as degenerate as they were, the colonials were resilient survivors, able to hold on to life in the harshest conditions. As time passed, they began to organize themselves in differentiated colonies instead of homogeneous mats. In the colonies, each human cell would perform a singular function and benefit from the union of others. Thus began the great age of organization.
Act, during which different colonies competed with each other to developing specialized human cells that would give them an edge in the struggle for life. Some colonies grew enormous tap roots that were able to siphon resources from far away. Others abandoned roots altogether and began to move themselves on starfish-like foot segments. Some colonies came up with units equipped with claws and poisons, taking competition to a brand new deadly level. Others responded to the threat with armor plating or watcher cells equipped with enormous eyes. The eventual winner of this colonial arms race was a sentient colony organized around hyper-specialized units whose entire purpose was to direct the others. These colonies spread around the planet as they adapted the parts of their rivals to function within themselves. Thus were the modular people born. Living in a fully industrialized megalopoly, they came in an indescribable variation of shapes and sizes. Anything from castle-like guardian fortresses to diminutive scuttling couriers as a member of the modular world. They could combine with each other and split up or exchange parts as needs presented themselves. The only thing constant in all of their protein existence was their mental and cultural unity. Due to their biological structure, these people had managed the impossible. They were actually living in a world of peace and utopian equality, where everyone was happy to be part of a greater united holes. Terra Sapiens, descendants of the Flyers. The Flyers' supercharged hearts had given them an evolutionary winning hand, and they diversified to fill up the heavens. It was only a matter of time before the competition in the skies got too intense, even for their souped-up metabolisms. Some lineages gave up their wings and returned to the ground, living as differing sorts of predators, herbivores, and even swimmers. Their aerial adaptations gave them an edge on the ground, and they produced forms of stupendous size and agility. There were wonderful beings, but no sentience came out of the terrestrial sky beasts. Instead, civilization flowered in the skies. One species from a line of waiting stork-like predators evolved a brain that was large enough to imagine and act upon the world. Their feet, already versatile to catch slippery, swamp-dwelling prey, got even more articulate and assumed the role of hands. As a compensation, they lost some of their aerial streamlining, but what they could not do with their bodies, they were more than able to make up with their minds. The power of flight made the Terrasapiens a global folk before they could invent nations and borders. With such an inherent ease of travel, ideas and individuals diffused too fast for social differences to ossify. Acting with a planetary awareness, they farmed their gigantic terrestrial relatives, raised cities of perches and fluting towers, harnessed the atom, and began to gaze up to the stars. Without having to compensate too much for the average individual's welfare and without dividing up into quarrelsome factions. As egalitarian as their life seemed, they paid a stunting, inevitable price. Their hearts, even in their boosted state. As a consequence, they had an ephemeral existence. A Terrasapien was sexually mature at two, middle aged by 16, and usually dead by 23 years of age. This grim cycle caused them to appreciate every moment of their existence dearly, and they pondered upon it with fervish intensity. A shelf of scrolls by Terrasapien philosophers would have been the envy of even human libraries. In their cities, life blazed away with unreal speed, rushing past to meet fleeting deadlines. As a species, the angelic flyers were victims of heart disease. Asymmetric people, descendants of the lopsiders. Although contorted by gravity, the lopsiders managed to regain their sentience and develop a civilization in a short few million years. Squat, pancake-like buildings spread all over their planet. These constructs looked like squashed bunkers, and they were never more than a few meters high. They did not seem like much, but such structures were entrances to underground homes, schools, 
hospitals, temples, universities, but also embassies, prisons, asylums, command centers, and arsenals. They lived strange lives, but the lopsiders were human in all of their virtues and evils. Thus, it was only natural for them to expand outward and to look to new frontiers to colonize. Fortunately, their solar system harbored other planets similar to the lopsiders' home world in almost all respects. All respects except gravity. But they weren't willing to let such trivial details stop them. Throughout their history, humans had always risked changing themselves to preserve their future. It was a risky gamble, but it had paid off since the days of the Martian Americans. But re-engineering the flattened lopsider body for a benign gravity was a monumental task indeed. Suffice to say that the experiments took millennia to achieve even limited success. After countless attempts, the asymmetric people were born, or rather made. Their bodies were changed considerably. What had been shovel-like toes to slither through the high-gravity dirt had become centipede legs, and the singular grasping hand was elongated to an extreme degree. Their grotesque faces had been inverted and turned upside down after reverting from a flounder-like existence. Twisted as they were, members of this new race enjoyed tremendous advantages over their flattened forefathers. Their social development also paralleled that of the bygone Martian Americans. Once again, there was a golden age, followed by increasing tensions and interplanetary war. But unlike the Martians, the asymmetrics ruthlessly exterminated their parent race and went on to rule the solar system alone. On the way, they stumbled across the remains of the Q and the Star People and advanced immensely. Triumphant on their own realm, they turn to the heavens to further exploits. Symbiotes, descendants of the parasites. As time passed, the relationships between the parasites and their hosts got connected to such a degree that it began to involve a cooperation of the individual's there were no longer single-sided relationships. In exchange for the host's nutritious blood, the parasites offered their heightened senses as early warning against predators and other hazards. A great arms race of symbiotic relationships thus commenced. Certain parasites offered their host larger eyes, other sharper senses of smell, hearing, or even additional defensive weapons in the shape of venomous saliva, malodorant sprays, or an extra bite. The host returned the favor with longer running legs, stronger bodies, and specialized ergonomic nesting sites rich in blood vessels and covered in insulating fur. Different complexes of parasites and host species evolved, compatible only amongst themselves. The development of such creatures was in a way reminiscent of the great modular colonies, thriving on their own world light years away. But unlike the modulars, the components of the symbiotes belong to a different species, instead of modified variations of the same basic organism. In eventuality, both relationships led to the same point. Sentience. In the secluded forests of a certain continent, a new parasitic species developed. They did not have the ballistic poison sprays, infectious stings, or the grossly hypertrophied arm claws of their relatives. Instead, these parasites offered a simpler bargain, an ability to think in return for total submission. Initially, this relationship was more like a horse and its rider. But after a few hundred thousand years, the symbiotes could manipulate their hosts like puppets through a combination of tactile and olfactory signals. A few more millennia, and these combined beings developed an order not unlike our own, complete with countries, politics, and even war, albeit reduced in the newly globalizing world culture. In this age, technology filled most functions of the host, but a thriving husbandry of these creatures still remain due to tradition and simple efficiency. An average symbiote would begin the day on his business host and move on to a more comfortable domestic one when they returned home after work. And perhaps on the olfactory television, he would smell news of the evacuations of the million year old Q ruins of the marvelous discovery salvaged from the Starman wrecks or of the enormous radio arrays that rose everywhere to listen to the stars. 
It was a pattern that was being repeated all over. Sail people, descendants of the finger fishers. The finger fishers were already among the most divergent of the post-human races. With harpoon-like digits and almost crocodilian muzzles, they looked nothing like their parental stock. But even this form would look conservative to their sentient descendants. With many small scattered islands, isolated subcontinents, and different niches, their home world was an evolutionary cauldron where isolated members of certain species could, under the right circumstances, evolve into wildly different forms. This condition was similar to the island realms of Madagascar, Galapagos, or Hawaii on Earth, except that this time, it was on a global scale. Some descendants of the fishers, trapped on lonely islands, grew smaller and developed their fishing claws into graceful wings. Others took directly to the sea and became the, the analogous of whales and dolphins. Within this evolutionary bubbling, one particular lineage gave rise to the ancestral sail people. They too elongated their fingers into wings, but these were not used for flight. Instead, they became sails that drove them effortlessly across the ocean. With fingers turned into sails, they used their mouths and extended tongues to catch their prey. These organs eventually assumed the role of the fisher's long atrophied, dexterous hands. The need to better navigate the endless seas put an inevitable pressure on their memories, and the sailors' brains grew correspondingly. It was only a matter of time until one of these navigators became smart enough to think. Even when sentient, the sail people still needed a long time to achieve any sort of social stability. Their scattered world made for a tremendous diversity of cultures, which competed and fought just as resiliently across generations. Untold flotillas of tribal warriors battled each other in epoch-spanning, pointless conflicts. Nomadic warriors and pirate societies inevitably came into being, prolonging the uncontrollable cycle of violence. Only when a certain warrior tribe developed warfare on an industrial scale and the state society needed to support it, and then only when this notion of modernity gave rise to the idea of peace did the sail people finally manage to unify. Generations of blood had stained the ocean for far too long. Sartiriacs, descendants of the hedonists. Their pleasure-drenched existence locked between their static paradise world and their inherently slow pace of evolution seemed immune to change. Perhaps this was true for a million years or so, but on a larger scale, complete stasis was a fable. During a particular era, Geologic upheavals threw up huge masses of land over the shallow oceans of their world. The hedonists, until then trapped on a singular island no bigger than today's Iceland, were not late to colonize these new pastures. This was more of a necessary exodus, since the events that raised the new lands had also thrown up enormous clouds of ash that smothered the atmosphere and blocked out the sun. Their innocence finally spoiled, most of the hedonists died out, unable to adapt. The only survivors were fast-breeding freaks who had abandoned the reproductive quirks of their ancestors. It was these forms that colonized the newborn continent and gave rise to a multitude of species, which included the satyriacs, sentient heirs to the hedonists. These beings resembled their ancestors to a great degree, except that they now sported enormous tails, boneless organs of balance woven out of extended pelvic muscles and fat. Along this appendage, their entire bodies were reoriented in horizontal, almost dinosaurian postures. Although they had abandoned the frantic reproductive strategies of their ancestors, their social lives still retained a delightful tint of casual promiscuity. The Satyriac civilization was quick to establish itself globally, for even with the additional landmass, the terrestrial domain of their world remained no larger than Australia. For a while, three and then two land empires competed against each other before dissolving into a myriad of smaller nations and finally reunifying into a coherent world order. From this point on, 
the Tyriac world once again became a Valhalla of pleasure with festivals, concerts, and ritualized orgies punctuating every working week. This time, however, it could all be savored by true intelligence. Bug facers, descendants of the insect off a guy. Over time, their insectivore ancestors came to resemble their prey. Hardened leathery plates, once used for defense against stings and bites, ossified and became integrated into the jaw structure. Their hands and feet, with reduced numbers of fingers and toes, developed into pincer-like affairs. Even their metabolism reverted partially into ectothermy in the balmy, lazy climate of their planet. But it was none of those adaptations that gave them the edge in survival. Simply put, a congenial defect allowed them to regain their sentience. Even after the smothering by the queue, the genes of the star people remained dormant in their cells. Through pure coincidence, one lineage of the insectophagi developed an atavistic throwback, resulting in larger brains, which just happened to be useful in cracking open insect nests with crude stone tools. It was an easy ride from there on, although millennia long in itself, the development from stone axe to spaceship was an eye blink in geological time. Like many other species, the bug facers passed through consecutive cycles as agrarian, in their case, hive farming empires, colonial endeavors, industrialization, massive world wars, and finally globalized world states. But there was one thing that set their development apart from all other post-human species. They faced another alien invasion. History does not record much about these invaders, except that unlike the Q, theirs was a singular effort and it was beaten off an intense cycle of orbital and terrestrial wars. Although vanquished, the invaders did succeed in leaving behind their traces. They introduced their own flora and fauna, which flourished on the bug facers home planet long after they departed. More importantly, they imbibed the poor bug facers with a pathological interspecies xenophobia to the point that they were even fearful of their own post-human cousins on other stars. Through an ironic twist of fate, their fears would be more than justified. Though not just yet. The bug facers still had time. Astromorphs, descendants of the spacers. Initially refugees, the spacers were quick to master the vastness of interstellar space. Their isolated space arcs joined together and multiplied to form a gigantic interlocked artifact that was large enough to contain entire worlds. But no planets lay inside the astromorph's capital, only cavernous, gravity-free bubbles where the inhabitants could finally develop to their fullest Freed from the constraints of weight, their bodies grew spindly and insectile, with individual digits extending into multitudes of thin, versatile limbs. Other than these, the only developed organs were their derived jet sphincters, which went on to become the principal means of locomotion. But above all were their brains, their bulging, swollen brains, with no hindrance from gravity. The human brain could grow into unprecedented sizes. Each generation devised experiments that produced offspring with greater cranial capacity, giving rise to beings who went through their everyday lives thinking in concepts and structures scarcely comprehensible to people of today. The physiological limitations of the human mind had been long since debated. Now it was established that these limits were indeed real, and individuals who could break them would likewise conquer new grounds in philosophy, art, and science. Everything changed. Yet some aspects of humanity, such as the basic desire to expand, remained. 
To this end, the astromorphs built great fleets of globular sub arcs and spread their influence across the heavens into every stellar cluster and every star system. Within less than a thousand years, the galaxy was straddled by a new and far more alien empire of man. Strangely enough, its dominion included none of the newly emerged post-human species. For its masters had completely lost interest in planets, those stunting, gravity-chained balls of dirt and ice. The newborn Ark settled comfortably in the outer rims of star systems, quietly observing the lives of their struggling relatives. For the first time in history, there were actual gods in the myriad human skies. They were silent and weren't even noticed for most of the time, but their watchfulness was ultimately going to pay off. Second Galactic Empire Over time, the sentient post-humans began to reach out to the galaxy. They inevitably stumbled across the ruins of the star men and figured out their interstellar ancestry. These discoveries were followed by a realization that there might be others like them unimaginable distances away. Thus, the fledgling civilization set about to probing the skies. The contacts all established by radio communication, were not spread out evenly. The empire began little more than a few million years after the Q left, with the first dialogue between the earliest killer folk and the Satyriacs. A few thousand years later, they were joined by the tool breeders, hailing out from the ocean depths through living radio arrays. The second wave of sentient species joined in during the following 10 million years as the modular whole, petrosapiens, and the fledgling asymmetrics contacted their celestial cousins. Finally, in the next 20 million years, newly evolving civilizations such as the Soros, the Snake People, Parasite Symbiotes, and the Sail People successively contacted the burgeoning galactic empire. The bug facers were aware of the whole process, but due to their xenophobic experience, they only opened up after a staggering 40 million years of silence. This union was an empire of speech, for actual travel between the stars was too difficult to be practical. Like the bygone colonies of the star men, the post-humans cooperated through the unrestricted exchange of information and experience. Although covering every aspect of an astonishing variety of cultures, the empire's efforts focused on two main issues, political unification, and galactic awareness, constant readiness for possible alien invasions. Everybody had come across the remains of the mysterious Q. Nobody wanted a repeat of the same scenario. When the second empire ran into the astromorphs who had silently saturated the galaxy with their own empire of man, they feared the worst. But luckily for them, the godlike beings were not interested in a second empire, nor any of its worlds. The astromorphs were given a wide breath and accepted as they were incomprehensible, omnipotent forces of nature. This coordinated effort lasted for almost 80 million years, during which its member species attained previously unimaginable levels of culture, welfare, and technology. Each species colonized a few dozen worlds of their own, in which nations, cultures, individuals live to the fullest potentials of their existence. Needless to say, all of this was only possible through constant communication and a total openness to the galaxy. Most communities took this for granted and dutifully participated in the galactic dialogues. But there were others, silent, darkened beings who refused to join in. Through them would come the ruin of the empire. Enter the Gravitals, descendants of the Ruin Haunters. After the lessons of the Q, the Second Galactic Empire kept a constant watch against alien invasion. Ironically, they neglected to look among themselves. The second great invasion of the galaxy came not from outside, 
but from within. The ruin haunters who were lucky enough to inherit the secrets of the star men in the queue when other species were mere animals had experienced a tremendous advance in technological prowess. All in all, they were as sophisticated as, if not more, than the astromorphs of the void. But their ascendancy was not a sane one. Recall that most ruin haunters were already deranged with a twisted assumption of being the sole inheritors of the starmen. They refused to communicate with their relatives on other planets and kept to their own affairs. This neurotic hubris assumed truly dangerous proportions after the ruin haunters modified themselves. The origin of this modification lay in an earlier catastrophe. The Ruin Haunter's son was undergoing a rapid phase of expansion, and the species, advanced as it was, could do nothing to stop the process. So the Haunters did the next best thing and changed their bodies. The infernal conditions of the solar expansion meant that a biological reconstruction was totally out of the question. Thus, the Haunters replaced their bodies with machines, floating spheres of metal that moved and molded their environment through subtle manipulations of gravity fields. In earlier versions, the spheres still cradled the organic brains of the last haunters, but in successive generations, ways to contain the mind within quantum computers were devised, and the transformation became absolute. The ruin haunters were replaced by the completely mechanical gravitals. While not even organic, the gravital still retained human dreams, human ambitions, and human delusions of grandeur. This, combined with mechanical bodies that allowed them to cross space with ease, made interstellar war a frightening possibility. Machine invasion. It took a long time for the gravital to prepare. Propulsion systems were perfected and new bodies capable of withstanding the interstellar jumps were devised. But when they finally decided that the time was nigh, nothing survived the slaughter. The invasion followed a brutally simple plan. The target world's suns were blockaded and their light was trapped behind specially constructed million mile sails. If the dying worlds managed to resist, an asteroid or two finished them off. Enormous invasion fleets were built, but it was rarely necessary to deploy them. The machines had caught their cousins completely off guard. The great dying, all of which occurred in a relatively quick 10,000 year period, stretched the boundaries of genocide and horror. Almost all of the new human species, unique beings who had endured mass extinctions, navigated evolutionary knife edges, and survived to build worlds of their own, vanished without a trace. Even the Q had been loyal to life. They had distorted and subjugated their victims, but in the end, they had allowed them to survive. To the machines, however, life was a luxury. Such thorough ruthlessness was not, ironically, born out of any kind of actual hatred. The gravital, long accustomed to their mechanical bodies, simply didn't acknowledge the life of their organic cousins. When this apathy was mixed with their insane claims as the sole heirs of the starmen, the extinctions were carried out with the banality of, say, an engineer tearing down an abandoned building. Under the reign of the machines, the galaxy entered a brand new dark age. When considering the invasion, the machine invasion brought on the greatest wave of extinctions the galaxy had ever seen, for it was not a simple act of war by one species against another, but a systemized destruction of life itself. When considering such a vast event, it's easy to get lost in romantic delusions. It's almost as easy to write off the gravital as evil as it is to consider the entire episode as a nihilistic end of everything kind of scenario. Both of these approaches are, as they would be in any historical situation, monumental fallacies. To begin with, the gravital were not evil, at least not to their own perception. These beings, although mechanical, still lived their lives as individuals and operated inside coherent societies. 
They had surrendered their organic heritage, but their minds were not the cold, calculating engines of true machines. Even after giving orders that would destroy a billion souls, a gravital would have a home to go to, and as incredibly as it might sound, a family and a circle of friends towards which it felt genuine affection. Despite being endowed with compassion, their harsh treatment of the organics was the result of, as mentioned before, a simple inability to understand their right to live. Furthermore, the gravital did not constitute a singular, indivisible whole whose entire purpose was to wreck the universe. True, their technological advancement had allowed them to form a pan-galactic entity, but within itself, the machine empire was divided into political factions and even religious faiths. Superimposed over these fault lines were the daily lives and personal affairs of families and individuals. Like any sentient being, they had a sense of identity and thus differing agendas. Nor did the machine invasion mean the end of everything. There certainly was a widespread destruction of life, but what was lost was only organic life, consuming energy, directing it for reproduction, thought, and even evolution. The machines were as alive as any carbon-based organism. Despite the turnover, life of a sort survived, and as would be seen, even preserved some of its organic predecessors. Subjects, the many descendants of the bug facers. The bug facers, racially shy and xenophobic due to their background of repeated alien invasions, became the first species to face the gravital onslaught. As ironic as their fate seemed, the bug facers were the luckiest of the post humans. Instead of being exterminated like the rest of their cousins, they survived as the only organic beings in the machine empire. The precise reason for their retention remains unknown to this day. Perhaps the machines hadn't perfected their ruthless apathy by then, or perhaps they pitied the poor organics and allowed them to maintain a stunted parody of an existence. Whatever the reason, the bug facers endured, but they hardly resembled their original ancestors anymore. Genetic engineering, the lost art of the galaxy threading queue, and later the tool breeders as well, was mastered almost as comprehensively by the machines, not hesitating to warp the beings which they did not really consider to be alive. They spliced their way into bug facer DNA, producing generations of literal abominations. Would a woman or man of today show any apprehension towards reassembling a computer or even recycling trash? Such was the attitude of the triumphant gravital. Thus, multitudes of subjects were produced, distorted to such an extent that even the meddling of the Q seemed comparatively timid. Most of them were used as servants, caretakers, and manual laborers. These were the lucky forms. Some submen were reduced to the level of cell cultures, useful only for gas exchange and waste filtering. Others were molded into completely artificial ecologies, baroque simulations that served only as entertainment. Some machines, with their still human ambitions, took this practice into a new level and produced living works of art, doomed one-off creatures who existed purely as biological anachronisms, be it a tool, slave, or entertainment. Humanity narrowly held on to its biological heritage, while its machine cousins reigned supreme for an unbelievable 50 million years. The other machines. Recall that despite its galaxy cradling might, the machine empire was not homogeneous. It contained dozens of differing factions that did not always agree on everything, including the treatment of their downtrodden biological subjects. Some machines over a process involving several religious, social, and philosophical doctrines began to comprehend the universality of life and the common origin of organic and mechanical humanities. Initially, such individuals lived in seclusion or withheld their beliefs from the world. They secretly engineered lineages of subjects that could live, move, and think as freely as they could. In a few memorable instances, the engineers fell in love with their creations, and their martyrdom inspired other machines to think just a little differently. 
Eventually, the ideology gained enough momentum to be practiced openly in everyday life. However, the sect of toleration soon ran into odds with their hardline pan-mechanical rivals. The seething intolerance between the two factions finally broke when some tolerant machines wanted to set several worlds aside for unrestricted development of biological life. All hell broke loose, and the machine empire, the apparent seamless monolith of the galaxy, experienced its first short, bitter civil war. The war didn't cause any lasting damage, but it plainly illuminated one fact. The greatest entity in the galaxy was not without its problems. The fall of the machines, return of the spacers. In the longer run, the internal struggles of the machine empire just might have led to its downfall. But there was no need to wait that long, as the Empire died a shorter but immensely more cataclysmic death. For a long time, the machines and the Astromorph Empires had been eyeing each other nervously. They hadn't yet run into open confrontations, as the Astromorphs kept mostly to their outer space arcs and the machine empires occupied the planets. In almost every inhabitable solar system of the galaxy, the same upside-down tension built up between organic beings living in the void and machines inhabiting perfectly terrestrial worlds. Power was evenly balanced between the two rival empires. Moreover, this balance involved forces strong enough to destroy planets in mass. Each side knew that any kind of war would result in mutual annihilation, and only insanity could start such a conflict. Well, the post-Civil War empire of the machines did go insane. In a sense. In order to divert attention from internal struggles, it needed a new enemy to consolidate its rival factions against. How unwise that this enemy came to be the Astromorphs. It was unnecessary and nearly impossible to describe the carnage that followed. The conflicts lasted anywhere up to a few million years, and the resulting loss of life, both mechanical and organic, made the initial machine genocide seem irrelevant. When the cosmic dust settled, the winners displayed themselves. The conquerors were the astromorphs, changed beyond recognition after 50 million years of continual self-perfection. Their grossly hypertrophied brains stretched out like wings on either side, and their finger-derived limbs had formed into intricate sets of sails and legs, endowed with superior technology and limitless patience. These beings almost completely destroyed the machines, despite losing a substantial number of their own species. The conflict also thrust the astromorphs into the affairs of their long-neglected human cousins. As impossible as it seemed, some of the machine subjects had survived the ordeal. Now the astromorphs could no longer look away. With the machines gone, it was up to the astromorphs to clean up after them. They took up the subjects and used their genetic heritage to populate entire planets. During this age of reconstruction, which lasted for another two million years. Many astromorph world builders emerged as true gods, creating inhabited worlds almost out of scratch. Their subjects, meanwhile, became the inheritors of a truly new war-torn phoenix of a galaxy. The post-war galaxy. When replenishing lost worlds, the astromorph gods took measures to ensure the continued safety of their creations. The abrupt rise of the machines had shown that unless carefully regulated, the wealth of the stars could always host a race of pan-galactic usurpers. The astromorphs, watchful but ever transparent, didn't want to interfere directly. Instead, they produced terrestrial versions of their own kind to regulate the galaxy. They adapted their delicate ethereal fingers into spidery limbs, and shrunk their brains considerably to readjust to the rigors of gravity. The resulting sideline was stunted by astromorph standards, but still it produced demigods in every sense of the word. 
These beings, known often as the terrestrial spacers or simply as the terrestrials, nurtured and controlled the development of the post-war civilizations on many planets. They acted as caretakers, prophets, kings, and emperors, but also as grim reapers as the occasion dictated. The endeavor did not always proceed as smoothly as planned, of course. Most of the time, the newborn races refused to heed their mentors and in several cases even rebelled against them. Needless to say, this crime was always punished with a swift extinction. Furthermore, even the terrestrials grew corrupted. Instead of offering guidance, terrestrials on many planets simply played God, weaving contrived religions around themselves to, to shamelessly exploit their subjects. It was not ethical or even productive. But this method seemed to guarantee more stability than actually trying to bring up the new races. This way or another, organic sentience reclaimed its dominance in the galaxy. The new empire, managed by terrestrials, populated by a myriad descendants of the subjects, and overseen ultimately by the omniscient astromorphs, achieved greater progress and a longer-lasting calm in the galaxy than all of its predecessors combined. The new machines. Long after their fall from grace, the machines still clung on to existence. During the initial aftermath of the war, the astromorphs had planned to exterminate every last one of them, only to discover that the machines were simply too useful to destroy. For millions of years, they had perfected the interface between mind and machine to such an extent that they could live and operate in the most inhospitable conditions. Such beings, deprived of their galaxy-straddling power, would make invaluable contributions to research and exploration of the new empire. There was a sense of poetic justice in all this. The machines, who once distorted biological life forms to their whim, were finally treated to a similar fate. To begin with, the astromorphs completely scrapped their ability to self-contain gravitational manipulation the very force that had rendered them invulnerable in the first place. They were given finite lifespans and slightly numbed imaginations so that history would not repeat itself. The degradatory nature of these changes, however, did not imply an overall regression. Unlike their ancestors, the new machines were endowed with nanotechnological bodies that could remodel themselves continuously, which meant that they could come in every shape and size and imaginable, and then some that could not. The machine citizen could live for some time in the void of space, conducting research, and then transform into a completely different body plan for a holiday on a cometary halo, tropical jungle, or a methane ocean. He or she would also make the trip personally by growing temporary hyperdrives and ramjet engines. Despite these breathtaking versatilities, the machines were never as common or prominent, even after completely accepting their role as lowly citizens of the new empire. The greatest war in conceivable history had ingrained the organics with too deep a mistrust of their mechanical neighbors, and the new machines were always treated with a degree of discrimination. The sins of their fathers had come to shackle this most splendorous of all human species. Second Contact with successive waves of machine-aided discovery and colonization, the new empire grew exponentially. Such was the growth of wealth and progress that its description would need to use concepts that remain unexplored today. To talk with a man of today about the comings and goings of the new empire would be akin to giving lectures of 20th century geopolitics to a hunter-gatherer. This magnificent entity was not blind to the universe around it. It turned in its ears, eyes, sensors, and probed the events of the surrounding galaxies. The new galactics suspected that the surrounding nebula might have their indigenous folk, and it was wise to contact them before a misunderstanding or conflict could occur. On a darker side, these observations also served as lookouts for potential invaders. Even then, the memory of the queue was not forgotten. The discovery was eventually made. 
one of the neighboring galaxies was showing patterns of activity that were the unmistakable signs of sentient organization. Some thinkers reveled in the discovery of a new civilization, while others feared a return of the Q. Fortunately, this second encounter with an alien species provided to be a peaceful one. Perhaps the intelligence of both galaxies were finally mature enough to meet without quarreling. The other galaxy was dominated by connected unions of different beings, presided over by varying kinds of amphicephali, bizarre creatures that resembled giant snakes with heads on both ends, one of which bore a secondary retractable body that they would use to interact with the world. Apparently, they had undergone alternating series of regressions, evolutionary radiations, and self-imposed genetic makeovers, just as humanity had. With all of their wild differences, the amphicephali were welcome. They were the first, but surely not the last. Earth rediscovered. The purpose of this work is not to describe the limitless progress that followed the cross-galactic contact. One could go indefinitely, chronicling how the United Galaxies re-encountered and subdued the Q. How they cradled the suns with artificial shells, multiplying their inhabitable zones a billion fold. How they crisscrossed interstellar space with wormholes and made travel a thing of the past. Ultimately, descendants of those beings even conquered time itself, prolonging the existence of their minds indefinitely via rejuvenating technologies. For a time, all men were gods. But from your vantage point, one discovery truly stood out in this orgy of advance, compared with gargantuan achievements like the taming of space and the construction of star shells. It was a mere blip, a revelation of long forgotten trivia. This was the rediscovery of Earth, the birthplace of humanity where the omnipresent astromorphs, the star gliding machine, and the millions of humble resident races could all trace their origins. It was made quietly by a singular researcher combing the vestiges of forgotten history, decade after decade, millions of years of war, invasions, and extinctions had buried the evidence thoroughly and comprehensively. When she finally came across irrefutable evidence, nobody was around to celebrate. <laughs> that would come later. Return. The discovery sparked a certain amount of interest, though nowhere as much as other breakthroughs had. To most humans of the cosmos, their ancestral birthplace was simply an interesting piece of information, a piece of trivia with which they had lost all ties. Still, a ship was set forth, and it landed without ceremony. For now, there was no intelligence left on Earth. Too far away from the main centers of population, it had been completely ignored, gone stagnant and feral. But still, it was home. When the explorers stepped out, human feet trod on old Earth once more after an absence of 560 million years, mankind was home. All tomorrows, I must conclude my words with a confession. Mankind, the very species which we've been chronicling from its terrestrial infancy to its domination of the galaxies, is extinct. All of the beings which you heard in the preceding presentation, from the lowly worm to the wind-riding sail people, from the megalomaniacal gravital to the ultimate galactic citizens, lie a billion years dead. We're only beginning to piece the story together. What you hear was the best approximation of the truth. Why did they disappear? Perhaps it was a final, unimaginable war of annihilation that transcended the very meaning of conflict. Perhaps it was a gradual breakup of the United Galaxies and every race facing their private ends slowly afterwards. Or perhaps, the wildest theories suggest, it was a mass migration to another plane of existence, a journey into somewhere 
sometime, something else. But the bottom line is, we honestly don't know. Ultimately, however, what happened to humanity doesn't matter. Like every other story, it's a temporary one. Indeed long, but ultimately ephemeral. It didn't have a coherent ending, but then again, it didn't need to. The tale of humanity was never its ultimate domination of a thousand galaxies or its mysterious exit into the unknown. The essence of being human was none of that. Instead, it lay in the radio conversations of the still human machines, in the daily lives of the bizarrely twisted bug facers, in the endless love songs of the carefree hedonists, the rebellious demonstrations of the first true Martians, and in a way, the very life you lead at this very moment. Many throughout history were unaware of this most basic fact. The Q, in dreams of an ideal future, distorted the worlds they came across. Later on, the gravital, with their insane desire to recreate the past, caused the ugliest massacres in the history of the galaxy. Even now, it's sickeningly easy for beings to get lost in false grand narratives, living out completely driven lives in pursuit of non-existent codes, ideals, climaxes, and golden ages. In blindly thinking that their stories serve absolute ends, such creatures almost always end up harming themselves, if not those around them. To those like the misguided, look at the story of man and come to your senses. It's not the destination, but the trip that matters. What you do today influences tomorrow, not the other way around. Love today and seize all tomorrows. All Tomorrows, a billion-year chronicle of the myriad species and mixed fortunes of man by C.M. Coastman. Read by your reader and narrator, Phil KOE. You can find me at KOE Nation on YouTube and Twitch. This was an amazing time, an enjoyable time. It was great to be with you. And remember to seize all tomorrows. here and see if it just yeah, smooths itself out. Get back. Tell you what I'll do if I ever get back. I promise to refabricate you raging rivers of gold. That's what the brochure advertised. And now we're lost, we gotta take it down. Let you get them slow, it's hard to survive. Nice. Eldorado. Oh, Lord. Well, let's see how that one went. Yeah.